Welcome, everyone. We are glad to be here at the Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. For over 35 years, this organization has done so much for this community, and it's been on the front lines of helping to protect tenants, helping to protect New Yorkers and keep them in their homes, and really protecting the whole reality of a neighborhood that's been in transition, but where so many people uh, need to make sure that their rights are protected and they get to stay in the homes they love and in the neighborhood they love. And I appreciate deeply what Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation does for everyone in this community, and I am grateful to count them as an ally in our efforts to protect affordable housing and create new affordable housing for the people of the community. And today we have something to celebrate, and this is a great place to celebrate it. Since last summer, our tenant support unit has been going door to door in communities where New Yorkers are in danger of being forced out of their homes, where they're in danger of being treated unfairly. And our tenant support unit gives tenants the information that they deserve about their rights and make sure they know in particular that they have support available to them if they fear they're being evicted illegally or being harassed by their landlord, if they fear that repairs aren't being made or any other kind of service is being withheld, if they fear they're being overcharged by their landlord, our tenant support unit goes out there and helps them. And one of the things they do is to get our Department of Housing Preservation and Development involved to help uh, tenants, and it could also be on issues like repairs. HPD does a great job making sure that when a landlord hasn't done repairs, that they are made to do those repairs, or in some cases the city steps in, makes the repairs, and then charges the landlord. And that can be issues like mold and, and rodents and infestations and leaks, a whole host of things that really make life so difficult for families. HPD steps in to address those issues. So the good news today, and I'm very proud of this, proud to announce that the Tenant Support Unit has resolved its 1,000th case, 1,000 New York families that have been helped by the Tenant Support Unit to get what they need. In some cases, they got repairs that should have come to them long before. In other cases, we were able to protect them from eviction or to in any other way make sure that their rights were not being trampled on. And this is so important to so many people. This is the kind of real bread and butter thing that people expect of their government, to be helped in their hour of need. And the Tenant Support Unit has really done that beautifully. And in part because of the hard work of the Tenant Support Unit, along with some other very important factors and other changes that we've made, we've seen a 24 percent decrease in evictions by city marshals over the last two years. So there's really two pieces of good news today. The fact that the Tenant Support Unit has resolved its 1,000th case, helped 1,000 families fix the problems that they're facing, and we're proud to announce that there's been a 24 percent decrease in evictions by city marshals over the last two years. That means 7,000 families who were able to benefit and who in so many cases are staying in the neighborhood they love and in the home they love. So I want to thank uh, everyone who's here and has been a part of this. Uh, two people from the administration in particular want to thank Steve Banks, the commissioner of HRA, who has a long history uh, supporting New Yorkers in need uh, with legal aid and has brought a lot of that capacity now into the work we do. And I'll talk about the expansion we've made in legal aid and legal services in a second. And Vito Mustacholo, who is legendary in this city, Deputy Commissioner for Enforcement and Neighborhood Services at HPD, who is doing extraordinary work. This is a man who is beloved by tenants all over this city because he has used the power of government to take on landlords and get people the repairs that they, that they deserve. I also want to thank Charles Corliss, Executive Director of Inwood Community Services, and Ron Rasmussen, the Executive Director of Legal Services in New York City, and Magda Rosa Rios, Director of the Tenants' Rights Coalition. Thank you to all. Everyone has been together in this effort to protect tenants, excuse me, and support affordable housing. Now, the reality is that housing is the number one expense in our lives, particularly for New Yorkers. It's the number one cost we face. In this city, that's a, that's a big bite. 
out of our paychecks, out of the resources we have in our household budget. And it's also the area where the quality of life gets determined in so many ways. So when a tenant isn't getting a repair that they need, when there's mold, when there's rodents, when they're not getting heat, when they feel the threat of eviction hanging over them, nothing's more unsettling, nothing's more difficult for a family than worrying whether they're going to be able to afford their housing or whether they're going to lose the housing that they have, or if they can stay but stay in conditions that just aren't right for any family. And you're going to hear from a New Yorker in a moment from Emily, who's been living in an apartment with truly unacceptable conditions. She'll go into them, but she's had a host of repairs that weren't made by her landlord. She's been threatened with eviction. Uh, New Yorkers deserve better than that. They should never have to go through that. They should know their government is on their side. And we're proving that with our tenant support unit and with the work of all these wonderful agencies and organizations around us. This is about protecting the health and safety of New Yorkers. This is about making sure people's rights are respected. And I always say most landlords follow the law. Most landlords are responsible. But there's an unscrupulous group of landlords who are constantly trying to take advantage of tenants who we have to go at very hard. That's part of why we have increased by tenfold, ten times, the amount of legal aid and legal services available to tenants in this city. So people can pick up the phone, call 311, and know if they're being illegally harassed or illegally evicted that they can get a free lawyer provided by the city. And that's something that has not been available on this scale before in the city. We form a special task force with the attorney general and the state to investigate unscrupulous landlords who harass tenants, and that can include bringing criminal charges against these bad actors. And with the city council, very important piece of legislation that acted on the issue of the aggressive efforts of quote-unquote buyouts, the kinds of tactics that are now illegal where landlords would promise tenants buyouts that were too good to be true and, in fact, turned out to be too good to be true and left tenants without affordable housing. So the pressure tactics that were applied unscrupulously have now been made uh, illegal. All of these pieces are helping. There's always more to do, but all of these pieces are helping. And our affordable housing plan, which begins with preservation. Remember, 120,000 units out of our 200,000 in the plan is preserving affordable housing in place. So far, that's 26,000 apartments in this city that have been preserved in place over the last two years, enough for almost 70,000 New Yorkers, keeping our current affordable housing affordable. What we did with the million-plus rent-regulated apartments that had a rent freeze this year because the landlord's expenses simply hadn't gone up. All of these pieces come together to protect affordable housing in this city. And obviously, two crucial proposals before the city council now, mandatory inclusionary zoning. That will require developers to provide affordable housing where the policy applies, literally making it a requirement of the development process and zoning for quality and affordability that will make it much more uh, possible and easier and quicker to create senior housing in particular, addressing some of the arcane aspects of the law that are holding back our ability to create senior affordable housing. And seniors have certainly let us know how important that is to them. We cannot allow affordability in this city to become a thing of the past. We cannot allow this city to become only a place for those who have a lot of resources. It has to be a city for everyone. And these are the kind of measures we need to do that. And what we have today is evidence that these approaches are working. Tenant support unit, my hat's off to them for what they've done, all the families they've helped, all those evictions that are not happening now. That is proof that these policies are working. And it's a reminder to the tenants of New York City that their city government has their back, and we will be there for them. And I have to tell you, you'll hear from Emily it's so important to hear the stories of people who have really been put through hell and needed someone to have their back, and the city should be there for them. A reminder that anyone who feels they are being illegally harassed or illegally evicted or overcharged or denied heat or hot water, they can call 311. Any New Yorker who feels they're being treated in an unfair manner, an illegal manner by their landlord, call 311. We will get you a lawyer and we will fight for your rights. Now, a few words in Spanish. Nuestra unidad de apoyo a los inquilinos 
ha estado visitando casa por casa y ayudando a las familias que tienen problemas con caseros sin escrúpulos. Hoy me complace anunciar que ya hemos resuelto mil casos en los que ayudamos, ayudamos a las familias a conservar sus hogares. Esta es otra de las formas en que trabajamos para que todos los neoyorquinos podamos seguir viviendo en nuestra ciudad. Si necesitan ayuda, por favor, llaman al 311. I mentioned Emily, uh, an Inwood resident, someone who's fought just to have her basic rights acknowledged and respected, and a veteran of the United States Navy, and we thank her for what she's done for her country, and now we want to hear her story. Emily, let me give you a little height, though, as we do that. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Emily. I moved here from Virginia about four years ago with my 11-year-old son. Um, and I moved, my first apartment was in um, where I'm currently living now. Um, I'm going to school here. And uh, basically, I've been living with some of these damages for almost four years. Um, excessive mold, um, the floors like really not well insulated and not getting hot water and heat. Um, that makes it really hard for me to, you know, to even shower in my own home. Um, so the tenant support unit, someone from there, they knocked on my door and they helped me to um, get a free attorney or a free lawyer. And yeah, that's about it. And, so. and tell them what's happened since. Um, since then, um, I went to court um, and I'm just kind of like waiting right now to see what's going to happen. They're supposedly supposed to come fix um, these repairs um, the first week of March. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Now, leaders in this community have been fighting for tenants for a long time, and we really appreciate their support and their focus on affordable housing for the community. First, I'd like to introduce Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, to my district. Thank you to this particular institution, North Manhattan Improvement Corporation, that has a history of being one of the best institutions providing legal support in our city but also you are across the United Palace. If you stay here for a little hours, <laughs> you will be here enjoying the last show of Aventuras. <laughs> so Aventura for me as having two daughters is like the Selena Gomez or Justin Bieber. It's like, it's like you know, one of the most attractive group who fill out Madison Square Garden last year three days in a row. So they dedicated to, to you the whole month of February in a big show every day. So, you know, this is also, he speak on how our community has the talent, has the determination to stay here because we will stay in this community, in this underserved community. No doubt that also you came to the most, to the largest regulator apartment in the city of New York. Community of 12 is the one that has the largest regulator unit in the whole city, second after Buffalo in the state of New York. In the previous administration, we didn't receive any much reinvestments on protection, neither on construction or preservation. I can tell you that now with the new leadership, not only the tenants protection unit has made a big difference because the resources is there, but it's also the determination to bring the information, to connect those tenants who need it. 560 Auburn Avenue, is one of those buildings where here today there's more than 30 apartments that the landlord create fake lease to increase the rent. And that's why we thank Northern Manhattan, HPD, and the office of Eric Schneiderman because they're looking at those particular cases. It is unacceptable that when a landlord who get into a portfolio, and he or she know that there's like 20 or 25 or any percentage of units that are protected for them to use all the tactics, try to push people out. Pinnacle, Vantage, and others, they are over. We are living in the new administration, and that's a message that we, for me, I'm so proud to share, to share with the leader of our city. Every single tenant, especially from the underserved community, working class and middle class, they've been protected for the last couple of months. And I know that the investment will continue happening in our city because 
the measures is determined to bring those resources, especially to those men and women who need lawyers, that they don't have the money to hire a big firm or who has a big, a large number of, of, of lawyers. And for me, it is an honor to know that the mayor is so committed to work with the underserved community, such as Inwood, Washington Heights, and Marble Hill. Para mí es un gran placer poder decir que en la comunidad nuestra tenemos un alcalde, un líder, que por primera vez le está poniendo los recursos donde se necesitan. Aquellos hombres y mujeres, familias, que los landlords muchas veces los tigan, poniendo, usando estrategia, tratando de cambiarle leads que son falsos, tratando de ponerle otra, usar otra estrategia para sacarlo. Gracias a la unidad de protección, de apoyo a los inquilinos, que inició el alcalde Bill de Blasio, por fin, algo histórico. This is historic. We never have in the history of New York City a administration that guarantee free ten legal uh, tenant protection, free legal services for tenants. So for me, as someone who needed so much, who also saw 14,000 people moving from my district from 2000 to 2010 because our people could not afford to pay the rent and they were pushed out. Here we have a mayor with a vision to build affordable housing, a mayor that had put the money where his mouth is when it's come to provide legal uh, 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 services to our tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. And now another great champion of affordable housing for the community assembly member, Guillermo Linares. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and welcome uh, to Washington Heights. <clears throat> uh, with a face as a community, uh, many crises and challenges in the past, I recall when I used to be a teacher up here, the crisis in education because of overcrowding. And we managed to confront that and we see many schools then the wave of violence and crime that we uh, afflicted this community in the 90s again we face on uh, that challenge we work hard uh, to really make this community a wonderful community attractive and appealing and safe uh, but we now face a challenge that I think is unprecedented Everyone wants to move from further downtown uh, or from other places to this wonderful community surrounded by river and parks and very close to the southern part of Manhattan. And the, the result is that we see many property owners now uh, aggressively looking uh, to uh, put into the market uh, so many units that we have. Uh, the, as the councilman mentioned that we uh, are the largest concentration of regulated uh, units in the city of New York. 38,325 units are in my district alone, 53,000 north of 155th Street. Uh, when, when we approve uh, extending rent regulations uh, June 15 of last year, we wanted to make sure, because we already saw the aggressive harassment, the intimidation that many were uh, uh, pursuing uh, against the most vulnerable, by the way, the seniors uh, and other families uh, that are newly arrived and have no means to really fight back. And we uh, strengthened those laws. Uh, when I heard the mayor, and I want to commend him publicly here, that he was going to really uh, step up to come on the defense of seniors. I personally helped distribute with my staff it, to let the community know over 5,000 flyers in the train uh, entrance and across uh, the community to make everyone aware that every Thursday from 11 to 2 in the afternoon, we have someone from the unit helping tenants fight if they are being harassed. So from day one, my office has been working uh, with his office, uh, with uh, not just Northern Manhattan and Inwood Community Services, but a myriad of other organizations that help tenants with Legal Lay Society, because this is what I think we need if we want to say we've gone through thick and thin 
in this community, but this is our community. We're going to fight. We're going to stay here no matter what, and we're not alone as tenants. So, eh, quiero decirle que estoy muy contento y satisfecho eh, de estar aquí al lado eh, de nuestro eh, alcalde, Bill de Blasio, eh, al lado también de nuestro concejal, eh, que está aquí también, levantando la voz por los inquilinos eh, nuestros que eh, muchas veces son hostigados eh, por caseros inescrupulosos. Eh, esta es una comunidad que nosotros hemos batallado mucho para hacerla más segura y una más atractiva y más vivible. Pero ahora la amenaza más grande que tenemos es que nos están por echar eh, de aquí por los altos alquileres. Por eso me siento orgulloso de haber a, a, aprobado, junto con mi colega en la Asamblea y la Legislatura, cuatro años más de protección a 38,325 unidades regularizadas aquí. Pero no era suficiente. Había que también fortalecer y penalizar a aquellos que hostigan a los inquilinos. Cuando el alcalde estableció esta unidad para defender a los inquilinos, yo rápido me movilicé para poner disponible mi oficina que todos los jueves, y lo estoy diciendo, cualquiera que sienta hostigamiento puede venir y va a recibir ayuda y asistencia en el 2 días de Sherman, esquina 207, si usted siente hostigamiento o está siendo hostigado por su casero, porque esta es nuestra comunidad. Aquí estaremos, aquí hemos estado siempre y seguiremos hacia adelante. Muchísimas gracias, señor alcalde. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to hear from one more person, the executive director of this wonderful organization, the Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, Maria Lizardo. Thank you. Thank you. We have fans See, here. You got your fan I know, my here. fan. After 40, you need reading glasses, so I will put them on. Um, on behalf of NIMIC Board of Directors, our staff, program participants, some of our youth are here today, and the communities of Washington Heine and, and Edward, I would like to thank Mayor de Blasio for his support, Council Member Rodriguez and Assembly Member Linares for their ongoing support of our mission. Since 1979, NIMIC has been providing anti-displacement services to thousands of individuals and families per year. Our weatherization department worked with, on 375 units in 10 buildings. Our tenant organizing efforts focus on developing and supporting tenant leaders who work on improving, uh, improving apartment and building conditions. Through our housing development work, we have developed 13 buildings, leading to the creation of 344 affordable units, and four of these buildings are now low-income co-ops. Last but not least, our legal services department has been on the forefront of preventing the eviction of over 5,000 households per year. We are proud to announce that thanks to the resources committed by the de Blasio administration and HRA and Commissioner Banks is here, we will be opening our first office in the Bronx, concentrating our efforts to prevent displacement of residents living in zip codes 10452 and 10453. Our housing unit has grown from seven paralegals to 10 and from six attorneys to 13. Thank you so much for this. NIMIC is proud to be a settlement house, a community-based center that addresses the myriad of needs of commu that community members face, whether it's providing domestic violence prevention services, conducting an immigration legal assessment through Action NYC, providing ESOL classes to recent immigrants, or placing a youth in an internship, NIMIC is committed to developing and supporting the strengths of our community member. In order to be a strong city, you need strong communities. In order to have a strong community, you need strong community members. NIMIC applauds the administration's focus on protecting tenants and, insurance that, and ensuring that individuals and families remain housed. Decent and affordable housing is a right that all New Yorkers should be able to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Okay, we will take questions on the topic of affordable housing, in particular the efforts to defend tenants, and then we'll take uh, other topics. First on this topic. Yes, Jennifer. Do you have any details about the thousandth case that we provide? The thousandth yeah, case? Like, you know, Let's see if anyone knows about the thousandth. That's a that's a very good question. Okay, she's one step ahead of you, Wiley. Damn good question. Should have had it ready. Okay, thank you, Jen. Took us to school there. Okay, go ahead. Of the 
thousand cases, has everyone been able to stay in their apartments or have you relocated them or what's the breakdown? So I'll define it. It's a variety of cases. Some are about stopping evictions. Some are about getting people heat, hot water, repairs. Now, remember, the two go together. Sometimes you got someone literally uh, being challenged by a landlord illegally, uh, being told they have to leave when they don't, being overcharged when they shouldn't be. That's one type of case. Sometimes you have landlords trying to evict people by making life miserable, taking away the heat, the hot water repairs. Sometimes it's not specifically to achieve eviction. It's just that the landlords are not providing the service they're legally obligated to do. So each case is different. But the thousand resolve means in each case we got the thing fixed. Either we got the heat back on, we got the repairs made, we got the eviction stopped. It's a variety. Okay, yes? How many open cases there are? How many open cases? Good question. Steve, would you know that? Or who knows that? Vito, Steve, anyone? It's a a fluid situation. Why don't you come over here? Come over here. About half the cases were for to legal services and like um, of the neighborhood uh, resident here. They're in various stages of resolution. It's a fluid situation. Some of the cases are very simple in the sense that it's a, a code uh, situation in which HPD can get involved and fix it. Some of them are legal cases that, that go on. Um, so we're aiming to get resolutions that keep people in stable housing. And sometimes that takes a short period of time. Sometimes that takes a long period of time. Okay. On this topic, yep. What's the city's track record when it gets involved of being able to keep people from being evicted? Steve can speak to um, the history of the legal element of it, and Vito can certainly talk about the repair piece of it. I will state the obvious up front. It's a hell of a lot better when, when, than when the city's not involved. When the city's not involved historically, a lot of people have had their rights trampled. A lot of people have had no lawyer, couldn't afford a lawyer, didn't know where to get a lawyer. Uh, it's positively sick what's happened to a lot of people. I've met so many tenants that had they had a lawyer in time, I'm talking about over years and years of talking to people, uh, they might have been able to stay in their home. They certainly would have had a better uh, standard of living. So this is a big problem. It has been for years. The most important thing is to get people the help they deserve while we can fix the situation. But in terms of, Steve, you want to add or Vito? The provision of legal services really makes the difference between preventing an eviction and not. Um, They have a tremendous track record, better than 90 percent over time, and they're taking difficult cases. Uh, They're taking the hardest cases. They're triaging. So uh, the cases that they're intervening in are difficult cases, and uh, overall they have a better than 90 percent track record. I will say also from... You know, my prior experience of representing individual homeless families, there's among the most frustrating things is to stand with somebody in a shelter with a court paper that you know that the provision of a lawyer could have prevented that uh, family from losing their home. And what these programs are doing now is making a difference in enabling people to stay in their homes. Yes. So over 90% of people, when you get involved, you're able to keep them from being evicted. Yes, across, across the system, obviously, different providers are working with different circumstances, rent regulated apartments, non rent regulated apartments, but overall, the success rate has been greater than 90%. Given the importance of lawyers to keeping people from being evicted, I'm wondering what you think of uh, a kind of a movement or a push or the idea of uh, providing lawyers for everybody who appears in housing court. I think the, uh, the focus on stopping illegal eviction and illegal overcharges is where the first focus needs to be. Look, we know there are people in housing court uh, where sometimes the landlord's in the wrong and sometimes the tenant's in the wrong. We're focused on making sure that any time the tenant is innocent and the landlord is illegally trying to evict that tenant or overcharge or harass, that they get a lawyer. So I think when you talk about a lawyer for every single case, you're talking about a much bigger universe and a much more, uh, a much clearer set of circumstances. But the reason we've increased legal aid 10 times is we want to make sure that when it comes down to something particularly as crucial as eviction, that people do have that legal help. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering how many uh, requests of repairs you have, because we do get a lot of complaints in the Bronx in this area of no heat, uh, you know, gun land or mold. I was wondering how long it takes to get uh, the repairs done, the wait time, and how are you coping with all those things? Well, Vito, Vito, come up and tell you, I want to emphasize, it's always very helpful to us to keep reminding tenants to call 311 if they're not getting a response from their property manager. Look, the building manager is supposed to take care of it. If they're not, we need to know about it. 
Because, again, we'll either make them do the repairs or we'll do them ourselves and charge uh, the building manager. Vito can give you a sense of the numbers. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. So, as the mayor indicated, um, so we do receive complaints. Um, we also uh, perform proactive inspections. Um, each year, we receive in excess of six hundred thousand calls through three one one that we respond to. Um, we issue about a half a million violations, um, and we spend about twelve million dollars a year uh, performing emergency repairs. And as the mayor indicated, um, what we do is if we, then we charge the owner, and if they fail to pay, we place a lien on the property. Uh, but I think the proactive initiatives that we have, the mayor mentioned the task force, um, it's been extremely aggressive, um, resulting in the arrest of an owner in Brooklyn uh, this past summer. Um, so we're also not only being reactionary uh, to complaints, but we're also being very proactive. Yes. Yeah, um, in the old administration, you know, if somebody filed to, uh, for a rent overcharge complaint, for example, they may have taken two years to get back to them, like DHCR, for example. Like, hey, how do you anticipate this new tenant protection unit would expedite that process so it would, you know, people get actually, tenants be actually here faster, get a faster response? Yeah, the difference, I want to be clear, this is, this is the city's tenant support unit as opposed to the state DHCR unit, which is a different thing. And uh, we also have, again, the legal aid, legal services component through 311. So two separate things the city has, different from the state. We're on a very aggressive timeline. I can't comment on the state dynamic. I can comment on the city one. We want to find people right away. And we say to organizations like Northern Manhattan, literally help us target. If you know someone who needs help, we want to find them. We want someone to go right to their door to get them the help to make sure they've got a lawyer. We don't want to just wait. We want to find out where there's someone in need. So the city takes a very aggressive approach, both in terms of the legal aid side and the repair side. Uh, and from our point of view, it's urgent. So many cases, we're going to save a family from being evicted. Now, what could happen to that family if they're evicted? Imagine a legally evicted family who ends up in a housing shelter, in a homeless shelter, I'm sorry, in a homeless shelter. Imagine what a horrible combination of outcomes that is, something done illegally that also resulted in a horrible outcome for that family. That's the kind of thing that's happened in the past that we won't tolerate. So we have to get to people urgently to try and make sure everything's right. The other thing we find is when you lose an apartment, a family is kicked out of an apartment illegally, a lot of times that apartment's no longer affordable for anyone else. So you actually lose some of your stock of affordable housing as another negative byproduct. So we take very seriously getting in there and trying to address each situation. These initial numbers are very promising. But this program is actually ramping up. We're going to be doing a lot more community outreach, working with a lot more organizations. And, again, the legal services uh, that's available to the public is increasing. It's going up higher as part of our budget. Yes. Okay. I was wondering, Mayor, if you to the average length of commitment that this is going to involve for the average resident who seeks out the legal provisions. We're talking about what length of time, on average, for someone who wants to... Will they have the legal help? I think that's a for the duration, but you can... Until the war is won, but let's let's see if Steve has a more uh, eloquent version of this. Uh, again, the the facts really speak for themselves. We're taking uh, a program that used to be funded annually at about six and a half million dollars, and now will be funded starting the fiscal year, be fully ramped up over the course of seventeen, sixty-two million dollars. So it's a tenfold increase in the amount of legal services that are provided. Uh, or funded, and the provision of legal services is to be provided until the cases can be resolved. Um, the organizations that we fund uh, through a competitive bidding process, including Northern Manhattan and Legal Services NYC and and uh, the Legal Aid Society, all have longstanding uh, track records of successfully preventing evictions and preventing tenant harassment and correcting conditions. So uh, our contractors are contractors that are there to ensure that uh, whenever possible, housing stability can be preserved. And so that's not a question of time. That's a question of providing expert legal assistance. And that's why we have experts involved. To, to, speaking of this aggressive outreach, how are we going to ensure that these organizations, I know that NIMIC does it here, but beyond this, if you're not affiliated with NIMIC, if you don't know about NIMIC, how are housing residents who need this help and may not necessarily be able to access you in English to be able to reach, get this information out to them? Right, three one one uh, is one just unifying way in which you call and you need a lawyer. You can be be uh, referred to the local community agencies, but all over the city there are organizations like NIMIC. 
that are working uh, together uh, with legal services and legal aid on the ground, very connected to grassroots organizations, uh, connected with elected officials. And, you know, in my time when I was at the Legal Aid Society, substantial numbers of referrals came from elected officials and community groups. Uh, and that will continue with these new programs as we expand them because uh, we want to make sure that everybody has access uh, and that everybody has the information that they need in order to know their rights. And just to follow on that, as you heard, the elected officials are actively participating, even sometimes having our representatives in their offices so people can come to them. So you can go to an elected official office in some cases, go to a community organization, call 311. But the more uh, community-based organizations that want to participate, the better. We've said this to Houses of Worship, too. Anyone who wants to help us by either identifying people in need and literally telling our tenant support unit, in which case we will go to people, we'll literally go to the door, we want as many people helping us at the grassroots level as possible. So we have plenty of room for more partners. But I'd ask you to let people know it's as simple as, in the first instance, picking up the phone and calling 311. On this topic, yes. Hi, and, and thank you for being here. Um, just to touch on the cost of the, of the rents, you know, in the area going high, there were, I know there was a group of people last, a few years ago, that took the landlord to court because of the rent they were paying in the Bronx, because the landlord priced up the cost of much more than the previous tenant. Is that... Does that still, because I'm not clear on how much they're allowed. Like if someone's paying a certain amount, that person moves out, gets priced out. They can just raise to whatever. It really obviously depends on the situation. What we found for sure is uh, people who are in rent-stabilized housing, for example, where there's very clear rules. You know, where we have the Rent Guidelines Board decides what a rent increase could be. Under us this year, it was a zero, a zero increase, a rent freeze for a one-year lease, a 2% for a two-year lease. But there are landlords who try to unscrupulously convince tenants that they have to pay a much higher increase. That's one example. There are landlords that tell tenants something illegal and try and convince them of it. Right? We have all sorts of situations, even with rent-stabilized apartments. We also have, in a variety of different uh, situations, landlords trying to get the tenants out by not providing the services. No heat, no hot water, no repairs or doing, you know, doing work on the building at all hours to try and make life unbearable. So it depends on the circumstance. We have particular protections that we can bring when someone's in a rent-stabilized apartment. But even if you're not in a rent-stabilized apartment, if your landlord is not providing basic standards of living, if they're not giving you heat and hot water, if they're obviously trying to harass you, there's grounds for legal action there, too. Do you want to add, Steve, anyone? Good? Okay. Yes. 1,000 starting when? 1,000. When did we start? We started in the summer. Does anyone know the exact date? Uh, July of 2000. July last year. And then for Emily, don't mind. Please. Um, what was the, the problems you had with your landlord? What was the landlord's response? And was there a last straw, a final straw? You said, I can't do this anymore. I got to call 311. Um, well, I did try to call 311 um, when, it was no, when I had no hot water or heat. But um, then I was just... I don't know. I was just living like that and um, paying my rent. And then um, somebody from the tenant support unit knocked on my door. So then from there, I was able to, like, receive help after that. And your landlord's response? Um, well, when I, well my, my building was bought, like, about a, over a year ago. And um, after that, um, they, like, wouldn't answer the phone for me. I would try to call. And they would never, like, I would try to reach out to them many times, and I never got a response. So. The landlord's response was no response. No response, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, man, for coming out to the community. I think that this is a great initiative for the illegal evictions that are a huge crisis in our community. But um, I have something else that I'm scared about, which is illegal eviction. I'm one of the people that pays over 15, I mean, over 50% of my income on rent. Um, I make $15 an hour. A lot of people in my neighborhood make less than that. We're fighting to get that to be the minimum wage. I know you wanted to support that. Mm -hmm. But my question to you is, why doesn't the new uh, housing, the, the um, MIH ZQA plan, accommodate for the income levels of our community? It seems like you're going to be causing legal evictions. No, I think it's, I understand the question, but I think it's quite the opposite. I think what we're seeing in a lot of communities in this city is that the market forces are driving people out consistently. And I've said this very bluntly, we've had, you know, 15 or 20 years of gentrification without any coherent government response. 
So what happened in communities all over the city? People lost affordable housing, no new affordable housing was created, no legal aid and legal services were provided to stop harassment and displacement. There was nothing. All there were were rampant market forces without any controls or regulation whatsoever. We've said, instead, we're going to have the ability to create a lot more affordable housing, to require that developers create affordable housing in a lot of the work they do, to require the opportunity to create more senior housing, because our senior population is the biggest growing demographic in this city, and a lot of people are on fixed incomes. And we're combining that with the legal aid and legal services for free, with the protection of our housing authority, with the rent freeze and the other efforts to help strengthen our rent regulations. So this, to me, is a coherent package that was needed a long time ago. We had none of those things. We literally had none of those things. So I certainly understand the fear of development pressures. It's perfectly appropriate. What our plan does is we devote a lot of our plan to folks at the lowest income levels, but we also make sure that there is affordable housing for people, for example, who work for the city. Nurses, firefighters, you know, folks, teachers, folks who are working in the city as well need affordable housing. We, we try to accommodate both. But remember... Well, no, we have, there certainly are options for people under 46,000, but let me say to you that remember that our plan, because I think this gets a little bit warped in translation here, 120,000 apartments out of 200,000 are preserving affordable housing in place, in communities, and that standard is people pay no more than 30% of their income. For someone like you, that would be a big change. Thank you very much. Last call on this. Media questions. Just want to make sure there are media questions. Yes. Um, how many cases were won? How many cases were won out of the 1,000? So 1,000 were resolved. Again, sometimes it was not a case of going to court. But in terms of, are you saying when, how many of the court cases? Okay. Do we have a breakout or we need to get that? Still pending. Still, you need to get that? Okay. We will get that to you. We will publish that. Yes. Quickly, what do you, you just mentioned senior housing, housing for seniors for your plan. What do you say to, there are some members of the city council who oppose some of the changes that you're proposing um, that would create more senior housing. What do you, what's your response? Seniors need affordable housing. That's my response. The reason AARP represents, I think it's over 800,000 seniors in New York City. It's almost a tenth of the people of this city. AARP is one of our strongest backers because they know for years the city of New York has not created enough senior affordable housing. The federal government used to have a very energetic senior affordable housing program. That was destroyed over the years uh, since Reagan came into office and then was made worse uh, during the Gingrich speakership, etc. And so when the federal government really stepped off the stage in terms of senior affordable housing, there was nothing to replace it. The city of New York has to play a major role in protecting seniors and creating affordable housing. Zoning for quality and affordability is one of the tools that will allow us to build more and build more quickly. So my answer to folks who have a concern, and a lot of them we're in real discussions with, and a lot of them have not made their final judgment. My answer is, this is something your constituents need. We want to work with you to make it work best for your community. But if our hands are tied and we can't create more senior housing, a lot of people on fixed incomes are not going to have a choice in this city. Last call. Yes, of course. Go ahead. I'm not that tall. Okay. Now you are. Um, I, I think that there, I want to highlight something that, that in, in some ways I have not been said with this initiative that the mayor has undertaken, and that is sending a clear message to someone who may be a property owner, a landlord, and may think that by being aggressive with tenants, they can get away with. And I think that that, that is something that we need to take out of this initiative, uh, that what it does if anybody has intention, uh, as an unscrupulous landlord, of harassing, will think twice about doing so because it is, won't be so easy to get away with it. And I think that that's a message that I think uh, should be uh, expressed here because uh, it is not just the 1,000, but perhaps the many others that could have been harassed. But because there is an initiative, someone looking after, someone that tenants can approach, can make that difference. And I just want to make that Thank point you. for you. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. 
Just on that point, is the, in these that thousand cases, is, are there penalties against landlords that have brought these cases, or is the penalty simply that the the tenant they're trying to evict stays in the apartment? Yeah, brought these cases well, respectfully is not the right term of art. I want to make sure we're saying the same thing. Um, again, some of these are situations where the tenant is not getting heat, hot water, whatever. We fix that either directly with uh, the landlord or the building manager, or we do the repairs and charge them. Others are court cases where the uh, tenant is being uh, threatened with eviction, we step in and give them the defense. So starting from there. Well, I guess my question is, is there making the point that there's, this may be a disincentive for landlords in the future to do this kind of thing? I'm asking, what is that disincentive? Like, oh, you mean, what, what? first of all, the fact that they're going to be found out has a lot of ramifications. Uh, I think it's quite clear that people who do illegal things don't like to be caught doing illegal things. So that's the, the first point, and that there's an opportunity cost that isn't there if you can get away with it. And unfortunately, for decades in this town, you could evict someone illegally as a landlord and pay very little price or have very little chance of detection. So the fact that there's now legal services being made available on a wide level means a lot more uh, people who are doing the wrong thing will be caught. In terms of legal uh, penalties or ramifications, could one of you want to speak to that? In terms of uh, violations, one of the remedies for poor conditions is the tenant can bring an affirmative case, and the lawyers that we fund can do those kinds of cases, and clearly in those cases, penalties and fines can be collected for violations. Similarly, where there's a defensive case and there are violations outstanding, penalties and fines can be part of that. But, you know, as the mayor said, a business model that once existed was people, tenants are unlikely to have lawyers in court. The vast majority of, of tenants uh, were, were unrepresented in these kinds of matters. The vast majority of landlords were represented. Now that there's the, um, a much higher likelihood in these kinds of cases that there will be a lawyer, uh, hopefully that will have the impact of people understanding that they're not going to be able to have the kind of approaches uh, go unnoticed that they took previously. And and just just let, me, let me answer one more point and to your follow-up. Remember, now that we're doing the task force with the attorney general, there also are circumstances that rise to criminal charges. So to be clear, you know, there are some that get to that point. It's not just about uh, civil problems and, and fines. Sometimes there are criminal issues as well. I was just going to ask, I mean, have you seen that there's any decrease in the number of cases that are, or I see cases, but in the instances where this sort of thing is happening uh, yet? I mean, obviously this program is new. So the 7,000 fewer evictions by the city marshals over the last two years is the best piece of evidence we have. Um, the dynamic around evictions isn't as clear and easy to track as some other things. But the evictions by the city marshals are a leading indicator. And the fact that there have been 7,000 fewer families evicted in the last two years certainly says that some combination of things is working. We think the legal uh, aid program is a part of it. In some cases, our other uh, preservation efforts and the work we're doing with grassroots organizations, which is making sure people are supported and defended. So, you know, there are a variety of factors. The rent freeze also. The rent freeze clearly uh, had a, a role to play here. But the one thing we know for sure is we're seeing fewer evictions, and that's before we've been able to provide the legal services at a higher level, which is kicking in right now and over these next months. So we think it's going to have even more impact. The, the biggest problem is a lot of people don't know they can get a lawyer for free, which is why we're standing here, to let people know if they feel they're being illegally harassed or illegally evicted that we will give them a lawyer for free. Last call on this topic. I have something to say before we go to the next topic. Last call on this topic. Going once, going twice, going three times. Okay. It is 2016 in the United States of America, and Donald Trump cannot disavow the KKK. This is unbelievable. It is disgusting. It's literally beyond the pale. And uh, I was watching Morning Joe this morning. I don't always agree with Joe Scarborough, but he came up with a, the exact right phrase. He said it's disqualifying. This is the year 2016. We're talking about... Uh, ending mass incarceration. We're talking openly about structural racism. We're talking about addressing the mistakes of our nation's history and making the nation whole. And you would think one thing that could be agreed upon by Democrat and Republican, conservative and liberal, is that the KKK played a horrible role in this nation's history, a heinous and violent and fundamentally un-American role in our history. 
But I watched the interview. I watched Donald Trump being given repeated opportunities to disavow the KKK, and he didn't do it. And then his second day response was as minimalist as humanly possible. He tried to use as few words as possible to create any separation with a violent white supremacist organization. That's what's going on here. So Trump has now taken his xenophobia to a whole new level, uh, where he's literally unable to separate himself with a full voice from a white supremacist organization. This is just unbelievable. And I think this is the kind of thing that will ultimately undo him. And by the way, uh, just for good measure, I say this as an Italian-American and someone who believes in democracy, I don't know a lot of people are comfortable quoting Benito Mussolini. Uh, most people would find that to be a problem. You know, it's, um, I think we could say, if I told you, here's a great quote, oh, it's by Stalin, or oh, it's by Hitler, but still, it's a great quote. That's what he said about Mussolini. He said it was an acceptable quote because it was a great quote, even though it was uttered by a fascist dictator. Uh, it gets not only stranger by the moment, but more dangerous by the moment. The good news is, this is a freedom-loving country, and people are not going to watch a candidate who's going to talk favorably about dictators and be unable to separate from the KKK. They're not going to leave that be. They're not going to take that lying down. I think a lot of people who may not have been motivated to be involved are going to get motivated in this election because Trump is showing his true colors. So I just want to say that up front. Open to any questions at this point. Yes. What do you think of Christie's endorsement of Trump? It's opportunism. I think he sees... Uh, you know, what he thinks is the front runner and is trying to play out his own uh, agenda. But again, Chris Christie f fancies himself a Northeastern moderate Republican. What does he have to say about the fact that his candidate can't really disavow the KKK? I think Governor Christie should be asked that question. Mayor, there were three fatal hit and run crashes over the weekend, and the numbers of hit and runs have continued to rise, even in your Vision Zero era. I'm wondering, is there something that you think the city is not doing to crack down on hit and run drivers? And if so, what is that? I will say first, it's very, very sad what's happened the last few days. And my heart goes out to the families. And it's disgusting that anyone would uh, kill another human being or hurt another human being and drive off. There's absolutely no excuse. And the penalties are severe, but they should be even more severe. And we'll certainly work for that. Uh, NYPD has a very good track record of finding these people. There's a lot more ways to find people in the past than in the past. There's a lot more video out there. And I have confidence that, you know, someone who thinks they're going to get away is not going to get away. In the vast majority of cases, we'll find them and we'll prosecute them. Uh, but we're going to do everything we can to keep strengthening Vision Zero. Vision Zero has brought us a lower speed limit. Uh, it's brought us a lot more enforcement by the NYPD of speeding and failing to yield to pedestrians. We're doing a lot more uh, interception of people who might be drunk drivers, so there's more checkpoints. But they're not everywhere. They're not 24 hours a day. Uh, but we're definitely ramping up enforcement in a, in a variety of ways, and the numbers prove that Vision Zero is working. But this is an area where we're going we're gonna to keep doing everything we can, and we certainly want to see tougher penalties. Yes. Yeah. The, the weather gets warmer in this area, um, and the motorcycles are out of control. Like, it's really dangerous. The, the speed that they go in, they do good little stunts. Yep. And, and, and it seems like it, it's not changing. Everything's still the same. Nothing's slowing them down. Nothing is... Well, that's a Vision Zero area, too. Anybody who is driving recklessly, endangering others, speeding, that's where we're doing more enforcement than ever. And I met uh, just in the last uh, week or so with Commissioner Bratton and Chief O'Neill, and we all agreed you're going to see even more NYPD enforcement on speeding, on reckless driving, on failure to yield to pedestrians. So anyone who thinks they can get away with it, they're going to be pulled over a lot more than they've ever been in the past. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the real estate deal with Boston Properties and the MTA. Oh, about the building, the headquarters building? Yeah. And ask me your opinion on that. And we spoke to um, Polly Trottenberg earlier today. Mm -hmm. said if she hadn't spoken up in that MTA board meeting, it's likely that this deal would have gone through. So that also brings up the issue of the three seats that are still empty and sure. haven't been appointed. So if you could address the deal first and then talk about those appointments. Well, there's three appointments pending in Albany, and they're all outstanding human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, so the... One of them is, is Adonis. Uh, 
look, I uh, certainly think the Senate should move forward with those three appointments so we can fill our representation on the MTA board. And I think the uh, very smart heads-up actions of uh, Commissioner Trottenberg are an example of why you need great board members on the MTA. They're an oversight board. You want them to look for things where there might be an issue. And uh, she did a great job with that. That was obviously a transaction that should not have moved forward and had to be looked at very carefully. There were legal and other problems with that transaction. So uh, kudos to her. But uh, my hope is uh, that the Senate will move. I've certainly uh, made clear to Leader Flanagan that we hope to move these uh, names forward as quickly as possible. Look, I think it is uh, important to have every seat filled so the voices of New Yorkers are represented and there's a maximum oversight over, uh, you know, MTA is obviously a state entity, but it has a huge impact on the everyday life of New York City residents. Uh, is the Cuomo administration threatening this city when it comes to federal housing bonds? Are you... Are you nervous or concerned that the city may not get as much money as you had in the past? Um, Do I look nervous? <laughs> are there discussions? I think uh, this proposal is being uh, roundly criticized uh, as being uh, bad policy. Um, the editorial boards have spoken. The state assembly has spoken. And uh, there's obviously... Uh, an existing approach that works, that has created a lot of affordable housing and should uh, move forward. The governor has raised a very valid concern about upstate New York uh, and economic development uh, plans. And, you know, that's something that should be treated, but not treated in this manner. Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the level, would you comment on the level of discourse in the Republican campaign? Uh, Mr. Rubio uh, decided to uh, speak about... Um, Mr. Trump's small hands is one. <laughs> this was, uh, is there a new, a new level of discourse that this has been reduced trivializing a president? Yeah, of course it is. And uh, I don't think it's ultimately what's going to find the favor of the people. There is, um, I don't, I, I, I don't want to ever do punditry. I want to note something, though. I see three very distinct things happening. One is xenophobia in the case of Trump. Uh, a second is an appeal to people who feel economically dislocated uh, and feel their government has not served them. And then a third is a sort of sensationalism, or as someone had said the other day, I think it was Van Jones said, the Kardashianization of the uh, political process. I think those are three distinct pieces. That second one is very real. I'm not saying I agree with Donald Trump's uh, plans or vision, but he is pointing out uh, a lot of the economic injustice that people are experiencing and the fact they feel their government has failed them. But that is a very different matter than the guy who's clearly xenophobic, who has spoken out against women, Muslims, Mexican-Americans, immigrants, uh, and cannot condemn the, the KKK and David Duke, uh, versus the guy who is a showman. And I think it's taken a while for all of us. I've certainly, it's kind of revealed itself in waves to me to understand that there's a lot of different things happening at once here. But that last one is dangerous because, um, you know, we're not electing a showman in chief. You know, we're not electing an entertainer in chief. This is a very serious time in history, and we're going to address these problems. You need someone serious. And, you know, I support Hillary Clinton, who I think is a smart, effective, experienced leader. That's who we need in the White House. But, I, again, I always believe the public figures it out. Right now, we're seeing a relatively small number of people who vote in Republican primaries and caucuses weighing in. That has a very different discussion than we get to the fall and people actually are going to choose a commander in chief. I think at that point, you're going to see something different. Yeah, Mayor, you have a town hall tonight in Bayside, Queens. I don't know if you've seen this yet, but State Senator Tony Avella is saying that you intentionally are, are snubbing him for tonight by sending an invitation to him late yesterday via email so that you could say that you invited him, but so that he wouldn't have enough time to actually plan to attend. So what He's you... been invited, and, you know, certainly we welcome all elected officials. It's as simple as that. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Behind you first. Going back to this conversation about uh, your budget, really. What are the city's next steps to help resolve the CUNY budget crisis that many of these people in this audience are, are desperately concerned about? And then secondly, did you join the First Lady in Washington House for Tuesday? Well, the First Lady was in California last night with our daughter, 
watching the Oscars. It was parent parent weekend out at my daughter's college, so they were watching. But we were sometimes comparing notes during the show. Some of it, yeah, not all of it. I watched Chris Rock's monologue, which I thought offered a lot of important points that people needed to hear. Uh, CUNY, yes. Um, we've made very clear that uh, these cuts are unacceptable. The CUNY proposed CUNY and Medicaid cuts, yeah, I assume that's what you're referring to, are unacceptable to the city of New York, would have a horrible impact on our students, would have a horrible impact on health care, would have a horrible impact on the city budget. Uh, we know that many, many members of the Assembly share our deep concern and have made clear they're unacceptable to them as well. The governor has said he will not uh, cost a penny. No, these cuts will not cost a penny to New York City. I've said many times I appreciate that clarification and I will hold him to it. So this will play out now over the next four weeks or so, and we intend to keep the governor to his word. Yes. About Times Square, uh, specifically the recent survey that some of the Broadway ticket sales are down because of the costume characters. Is there an update in terms of the proposal perhaps to make zones for those characters? Also, I know that Commissioner Bratton supported uh, tearing the plaza down. So could you possibly bring us up to speed on that? Yeah, sure. Um, the report in question does not present the whole reality. Broadway ticket sales are very strong. Uh, in many ways have reached historic levels, um, and they represent uh, folks who go to Broadway from the metropolitan region, from all over the country, all over the world. So Broadway's doing great. The report theoretically was talking about a subset of customers, but again, that's not a city report, that's one organization. Uh, we value Broadway a lot, Broadway's doing great. Uh, the plan that we announced for Times Square is proceeding. Uh, there's a lot more NYPD presence, that's quite obvious. And the NYPD is being very assertive in terms of enforcement of all kinds. Uh, in addition, we will have the separate zones uh, where certain activities will be allowed or not allowed. Uh, and, of course, the current work that's being done physically will be completed, I think, over the next year or so. So that plan continues on pace. Mayor de Blasio, the NYPD's latest statistics year to date say that subway crime is up 17 percent. There was another subway splashing this morning. And now a new poll saying that 51 percent of New Yorkers are afraid to ride the subway at night. <coughs> Just wondering what your response is. Um, I certainly understand why people are worried. And I want all New Yorkers to know that we're doing a lot to keep them safe. Now, the overall numbers we've talked about over the last couple of years are still true. You have basically a one in a million chance of being a victim of subway crime, uh, and that is primarily property crimes. That's what really is happening. The crime we have in the subway is overwhelmingly, you know, electronics being stolen. But I understand why people are concerned, and they're going to see more police presence. Uh, our strategic response group, which is one of our special units, uh, is going to be deployed to provide more presence in the subways. Uh, even though these incidents have been random, there's no connecting pattern to them. And many of them, as you've seen, have been really fights between two individuals, gotten to some kind of beef or altercation, uh, not random acts. Uh, we still take it very, very seriously. So the answer will be, and Commissioner Bratt and I talked about this over the weekend, more detailed plans uh, will be laid out over the next few days. But you'll see expanded police presence. Mayor de Blasio, yeah. can we talk about the NYPD officer who was killed also in a hit and run over the weekend? And then the last thing is there was another report saying that the FDNY response times were underreported. Right. I don't know if you've been. That, I haven't seen the details, but we know that report is not accurate. That's coming from uh, you know a labor organization that did not, in our view, look at all the facts. We have been very uh, careful about response time, and in fact, as you know, we've added ambulance tours uh, to help with ambulance response time. And we constantly monitor it, all FDNY, whether it's the, the fire apparatus or uh, the ambulance side of the operation. So that's just not an accurate report. Uh, on the officer, my heart goes out to his family, you know, someone who served this city and uh, was killed again. In the most, this is the most heinous of acts, to, to kill another human being with your car and then leave. In this case, killing an officer of the law, someone who protects us, and not even having the decency to stay and own up to it. Now, you could say, well, probably, maybe, that person was drunk. Well, they're not drunk anymore. <laughs> you know, they, they at some point sobered up, even if they were drunk. And they owed it to that officer's family to turn themselves in, and they still do. 
So, you know, it's not acceptable. And again, uh, one thing I found, NYPD gets their man or woman in the vast majority of cases, and we are going to be doing a lot to find these people. Um, a judge today is preventing the city from enforcing the assault ban. Do you want to comment on this? Um, I believe that the it's not assault ban, let me remind you. Gotcha. You know, you, warned, you got a point earlier. Point taken back. Okay. We are providing the public with information. And a lot of people appreciate that. They want to know what their salt intake is. Their doctors are telling them, be careful about how much salt. And a lot of times people don't realize how much they're getting. And by the way, as my wife likes to lecture me all the time, when you eat out, you're going to get a lot more salt in your food. It's just natural. That's what uh, you know, restaurants do. So this is just giving people information they need. Uh, we will prevail in the end. We're certainly never surprised when there's a setback in a judicial process. But we believe we'll uh, prevail in the end, and we're going to help people stay healthy by giving them the information they deserve. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.